What's up, guys? Hope you're all doing real well. Um, as you may know, I'm taking on the 52 book challenge for 2020 um, and getting into book number 13 here. So um, as I'm going through these, I'm leaving all the links to the books below that I've read. You can go check those out. And all these videos are in a playlist. So if you want to go and check out any of the other books that I've um, been summarizing here, um, go ahead and do that as well. Book number 13 is The Leadership by John C. Maxwell. So he's one of the best known authors around, uh, from what I've found anyway, on leadership. He's written a bunch of stuff on the subject, and this was a really, really good one. As usual, um, I like to, like I say, give things you can implement right away. Um, this whole book was things you could start implementing and practicing. I needed to pause and stop and process it a lot of the time, and uh, that that's a good thing. So, um, like I said, lots of stuff to talk about here. This is a really brief overview, um, and you guys, if you want more detail, obviously, go get the book. This one was really, really good as well. Um, so, there's kind of 11 essential changes he talks about making. Um, the first chapter was kind of an introduction into everything, talking about why people need to shift the way that they lead. And that's kind of because the way that we traditionally think about leadership kind of isn't the way that is the most impactful, the most influential. So um, in his words, we need to learn how to lead a little bit differently in order to become more successful and have more of an impact. The first of these essential changes came in chapter two, which is called changing from a soloist to a conductor. So he calls this the focus shift. So... One is too small a number to achieve any sort of greatness. So if you think of an orchestra in this situation, um, a lot of people may think um, the soloist is the leader, right? They're the ones who are in the forefront. They've got the big solo. Um, they're kind of leading the orchestra. They're the ones that stand out, right? Where he's saying in this example, we need to shift to more of that thinking like the conductor who has all these people organized and he is choreographing this whole the whole symphony in order to make this amazing sound right everyone they understand that everyone plays a role um, and that the soloist's role isn't necessarily any more important than anybody else in the orchestra so the second shift chapter number three talked about going from goals to growth so this is where you focus a little bit on more on personal development rather than just simply reaching for certain goals so a lot of businesses they might um, hand out like these are your sales targets this is the numbers you need to reach by the end of this quarter that sort of thing um, but instead maybe if you broke down these goals into certain skills that you needed to start working on then you could start focusing on those skills grow yourself um, focus on that personal growth, personal development, personal improvement, however you want to say it. Focus on that component and then that is what's going to also make you a better leader because you've gone through the process of learning and growing um, instead of just finding out the easiest way to just hit a couple sales targets or something like that. So what you focus on ends up growing. So if you focus on just doing goals, you'll grow that mindset of just getting to a goal however you're eat however you can our brains are you know pretty lazy we'll try to find the easiest way to get there but if we focus on the growth you go through the work um, and the personal development and then you grow as a person and become a better leader that way um, the third shift he talks about in chapter four is shifting from perks to price so he calls it the cost shift napoleon hill has a really good quote there that strength and growth come through continuous effort and struggle so a lot of times people want to become or be put in a leadership position because of all the perks that they think is associated with it, right? Maybe you'll get more money, um, you'll make more of an impact, you think, you'll be more influential, you get a good title, uh, he's talked about maybe getting a better parking spot. Um, so there's maybe a lot of perks that can come with leadership position, but if you're focusing on that, you're not going to be obviously as good of a leader as you could. So instead, he wants you to start shifting from what you can get to shifting to what you can give to other people. So providing more value to people. We've talked about that, or at least a lot of the books that I've been reading talk about that a ton. Focus on what you can give. So this 
um, what you can give is the price that you have to pay in order to become a truly influential leader. Chapter five or shift number four is shifting from pleasing people to challenging people. So he calls this one the relational shift. Um, a lot of times he used an example of how when he first started out, he just wanted to please everybody, right? He wanted to make everybody happy. That was his goal. That's what he thought being a good leader was. But as he says in the book as well, leadership um, is not a friendship business. It's a leadership business. You've probably heard a ton of ton before you'll never be able to make everybody happy and what he was saying is he was like running around town trying to make everybody happy trying to make all these commitments promising people certain things that he would be at certain places at certain times and it was just wearing him down because he wouldn't be able to show up and then he would need to make up for that fact and try to bring them back on and make them happy again and it just got into a cycle of disappointing remaking people happy again, disappointing and doing it again and again and again. And he was having to meet with people multiple times until it finally got patched over. Um, but that's not really what he's saying being a leader is. So you need to shift to uh, challenging people um, and start asking the best from them instead of just worrying about being a people pleaser. So demanding the best is where that shift needs to go to. And obviously you do it in... Um, in a in a proper way you aren't like being authoritarian or anything like that you are um just maybe yeah posing a little challenge and seeing or trying to motivate them to be just a little bit better chapter six or the fifth shift is going from maintaining to creating so this he calls the abundance shift good quote there from vince lombardi um he says that many jobs and traditions basically focus on the position of just kind of maintaining the status quo, right? You go to your job, you do your nine to five, you do what you've done every single day, blah, 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 blah. It stays the same, it maintains, nothing changes. Um, but if you want to become a leader, you need to start trying to think a little bit more outside the box, um, thinking a little bit differently, right? Push yourself to build new ideas. Um, but only where they're needed, right? Like if it's, if it's like you've probably heard the quote, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. He refers to it as don't tear down the fence if it doesn't need to be torn down. Um, but just starting to asking some questions and exploring some new ideas is going to tap into that creativity mindset. And it could obviously end up leading to new innovations and new ways of doing things like all the new technology that we've um, seen coming out, right? Um, people started thinking a little bit differently and instead of just staying with um, paper newspapers for example now you've got newspapers obviously coming um, online or whatever there's tons of different examples you could go off of there but just starting to think outside the box a little bit more um, is gonna be what obviously makes you a better leader as well chapter seven the sixth shift is ladder climbing to ladder buildings this was I like this chapter. I like the analogy and the mental imagery that can be associated with this chapter. So the reproduction shift, he's talking now about instead of just um, focusing on how high you can climb in order to feel like you gain leadership status or whatever, it's about reproducing what you've been through in order so that people can replicate that themselves. So that's where the reproduction part comes in. Um, He's got a lot of good quotes in here, but that's the one from Isaac Newton. Um, but there's kind of four stages that he talks about in this shift. So you might start with ladder climbing, which is focusing on yourself. You're just worried about how high you can build your own ladder, how high that can go. Ladder holding is where you kind of start helping others out just a little bit. And maybe you give them a little bit of guidance. Ladder extending maybe is where you're helping them out a lot. Maybe you're like almost holding their hand through the entire thing. But the biggest shift is when it comes to build, helping someone else build their own ladder. So when you teach them how to do it, right? You know, you've heard the phrase, teach a man or catch a man to fish, he'll eat for a day. But teach a man to fish, he'll eat for the rest of his life. It's the same sort of thing here. So you're trying to um, help the other person develop their own leadership and find their own way through it once they've gone through it themselves then that's where you truly are making the bigger impact because then you're not only just impacting that one person that person can then impact tons of other people down the line chapter eight the seventh shift 
from shifting from directing to connecting. So this one's about communication. Quite often we feel that leaders, you know, are the person standing at the front of the room or maybe it's like a coach or a teacher or someone who's in an authoritarian position and they're kind of like, or maybe like an army drill sergeant, right? Someone who's just barking out orders and directing people to do specific things. Um, that's kind of what we traditionally, I would say, view as leadership. Um, maybe it's more like they're, they're organizing, I guess, or directing, right? They're telling people what to do. Um, but instead, we want to try to connect with that person instead of just simply telling them how to do things or what to do, right? So if you shift to focusing again, connecting and trying to understand that person, try to understand what drives them, what motivates them, um, then you are going to be able to obviously connect with them and influence them and they buy into you a little bit more because they um, feel like they've been heard, you've connected with them, and yeah, they feel like you care. So too many people lead by assumption. What he means by that is like we assume we know what people want or we assume what people need. Um, when even if we haven't asked them yet. So make sure that you are asking them. He had a good example of a basketball team. That was a thing that uh, really shifted his mindset here that came into the locker room at halftime, and the coach said had three questions on the board. Um, what did we do well? What did we not do well? What do we need to do differently in the second half? So what did we do well in the first half? What did we do poorly in the first half? What do we need to work on in the second half? And the players just talked about it. And then once she understood what the players thought they had done well, what they had done bad, maybe she added a little bit of stuff in, but then this coach understood what she needed to coach or what they were thinking and how to improve that for the second half, which is really cool. And if you can do that with, regardless of whoever you're working with, um, that's going to be really powerful. Chapter nine, the eighth shift here. Um, we're changing from team uniformity to team diversity. So he calls this the improvement shift. Um, and it's actually, if you've been a part of a good team, you'll recognize that it's actually usually the differences that make the be the biggest um, impact or the biggest difference, right? So individual differences will lead to positive differences. As a team, um, yes, you want to be working towards the same end goal, maybe have the same values, the same vision, but you can't all be the exact same, right? You can't have the same skills, you can't have the same talents, you can't have the exact same mentality, all that sort of stuff. Um, if I'm thinking of like, I played a lot of volleyball, right? So on a volleyball team, it wouldn't necessarily be the best if everyone was the exact same, exact same height, had the exact same skills. Um, you need certain people to be better at certain positions, right? Yeah, if you're the setter, got to have good hands, got to have quick feet got to be able to put the ball in a good position for your attackers to hit um, it doesn't make much sense for a really really short person to be put in the middle position in the front row right so there's going to be differences and that is what's going to make your team better overall same thing in a workplace environment right so what's going to happen is people are obviously good at different things. Some people may be better at the technical side of things. Some people are good at writing. Some people are good at advertising. Some people are good at selling. So you're all working towards the same thing, but you find out which person has strengths in each individual area, and you let that person kind of roll with it because there's going to be people that aren't as good as you are at certain things, and that's fine, and you're going to be better at them than at other things. So the goal would be to look to create teams that have, or people in that team that have a bunch of different strengths and then utilize that to its full advantage. And it's the leader's responsibility to recognize that and put people into positions where they can succeed and have success. So chapter 10, the ninth shift, is moving from positional authority to moral authority. So a lot of times people think that the position or the title is what is going to give them um, leadership status or influence. But he says um, the true measure of leadership here is influence. It's not simply earning a title. So he had thought when he started out that um, because he was the pastor of this new community that he was the leader of that church community. And then he found out that he, he held his first meeting, he had an agenda and everything, and somebody else stepped up and kind of ran the meeting when he thought it was his meeting to run. Um, and that kind of made him realize that just because I have this title and I step into this position, it doesn't mean that I am the leader yet, right? 
So he found that the guy who was leading actually had the big, bigger influence, obviously because he'd been in the community a little bit longer. He had established um, some a good a good character, and his words and actions kind of matched, right? So just because you have the title does not mean that you have the same amount of influence. It's got to come from um, a body of work um, of, you know, words and actions matching together. That's where you'll create what's called moral authority and you'll have a bigger influence on people. Chapter number 11 and 12 deserve a little bit more and deserve their own slides. So this is the 10th the shift. He says this is probably the most important shift um, because it's the one that can lead to the most change. So we're going shifting from trained leader to a transformational leader. A good way to tell if you are a transformational leader is if your actions inspire people to learn more, do more, dream more, and become more. So there you can see a uh, comparison of the two side by side. Um, I'm not going to read them all out, but basically there are some there's some pretty big differences there. So um, the ones for the next chapter um, have a career and have a calling. We talk about those a little bit more, but basically I look at trained leaders and transformational leaders. Trained leaders kind of have that a fixed mindset, right? They're just kind of more fixed. Shouldn't say it's completely fixed, but it's a more of a fixed mindset, whereas transformational leaders have more of a growth mindset and they're looking to always kind of do more, impact more. Um, and as it says here, they, these people kind of are doing it for a career. These people, transformational leaders, are doing it because it is their calling. And that actually comes up in the next slide here. So chapter 12, the final shift, shifting from a career to shifting to having a calling. Again, there's the comparison side by side. Um, calling means that every, your life is kind of like everything revolves around this, this one thing. It's not like you don't have a job where you can just go to work, forget about it, come home, and your joy and your purpose and everything else comes from something outside of your job. A calling is like everything's ingrained into the, your life, like your, your calling, um, your joy, your happiness comes from this, this one source. It never leaves you, right? It's kind of always there and it feels like you, you must do it. Like, it's not like, oh, I have to do it. Like you, you want to do it. Um, and that, that's measured by significance, whereas a career or a job <clears throat> um, is measured by success. He talked about three levels here. Job was the first one, career was second, and then calling was third. But um, if you're looking at it from, yeah, the leadership standpoint, he's just comparing the career to the calling. Um, career is a little bit more selfish. It's mainly about you, you wanting to advance yourself. Calling means you're trying to advance others. Um, and a career you can choose, you can leave it. Um, but the calling, like I said before, never leaves you. That's all the books that I have for March. Um, like I said, links will all be down below if you want to go check those out. Moving on to April, I'm trying to catch up here. I'm a little bit behind. It's what? It's May. It's middle of May. I got to do some catching up here. But rattle off a few this week, so that's good. Um, and if anyone ever has requests for a book, go ahead and I'll read it and do a quick review on it. Um, if I feel like it's going to be good anyway. So moving on to April for the next video, have a good one crew.